no lo dice, enseña a cómo a conocer la industria, a la, la manufactura. Entonces, al final de la carrera tú sales conociendo lo que es la industria, paso a paso, desde que empieza un pedido hasta que tú se la entregas en la mano a un cliente. Y yo me sentí cuando llegué aquí, yo dije, esto parece imposible. Pero me empuja yo saber que voy a poderle dar un mejor futuro a mis hijos. Que si yo trabajo en una pasur, no voy a ganar ni la mitad de lo que, estoy, que, lo que puedo ganar con, con, un, con un asociado de un college. Esto es uh, un robot industrial. Eh, es un, una mano de robot donde tú tienes que aprender eh, cómo programarlo para que él haga, te agarre algo y te lo coloque en otro sitio. Mi desafío más grande todavía en la carrera ha sido el inglés. Lo que regularmente un estudiante le tomaría dos horas, a mí me toma cuatro y cinco. Porque primero viene el traducir y todo eso y entender los conceptos en, en inglés. Um, y, y pues se hace un poco desafiante para mí. En la escuela igual hablo inglés, en todas mis clases hablo inglés, pero afortunadamente tengo a mi maestro que habla español. Y cuando tengo una duda, él me empuja que todo sea en inglés y que trate de aprender todas las cosas en inglés. Pero cuando ya me ven esos trancones ahí que no puedo dar ni para adelante ni para atrás, entonces él sale a mi socorro. Yo soy madre de tres adolescentes, Abigail, Radames y Abraham. Y hasta ahora están sumamente contentos y orgullosos de los logros que hasta aquí he obtenido. Ella puede salir adelante con lo que ella quiera y también nos ayuda a nosotros a salir adelante con lo que nosotros queremos con, en nuestra vida. Yo tengo que salir hacia adelante por mis hijos, por lo tanto, tengo que sacrificar el tiempo que antes estaba con ellos, estaba tiempo completo con ellos. Ahora eh, tengo que utilizar mi tiempo con más sabiduría. Vale la pena y porque en el futuro vamos a tener un futuro mejor si ella logra esta meta. Yo me siento muy orgullosa porque yo puedo estudiar con mi mamá y aprender lo que ella está aprendiendo. Prácticamente han sido mi inspiración porque en vez de que, de que me resten, son los que me empujan. Cuando tú tienes personas, eh, hijos sobre todo, que, que, que te están mirando a ti como ejemplo, entonces tú no te puedes dar el lujo de fallar. Me veo ya con mi maestría, con mi maestría porque no pienso parar. Eh, quiero tener un buen trabajo, quiero seguir aprendiendo cada vez que tenga la oportunidad de sacar, sacar un certificado, pienso hacerlo, ya que este es un área bien cambiante porque se mantiene avanzando y es una de las cosas que me gustan. Yo no soy de las que me puedo sentar a hacer lo mismo todos los días. Si nosotros queremos eh, seguir hacia adelante, si nosotros queremos hacer la diferencia en este mundo, simplemente tenemos que salir a tocar puertas y muchas puertas se van a cerrar pero solamente necesitamos una sola que se nos abra. Y si una puerta se nos abrió, entra por ahí y coge camino. Good morning. I was really uh, in, an inspiration. Uh, It's, it's just fantastic to be with you uh, for a little bit uh, for ATE at 25, an incredible achievement. Uh, uh, my name is Lee Zia. I'm the Deputy Division Director for the NSF Division of Undergraduate Education. And I'm very proud to say that uh, this division is the one in which the ATE program sits. So uh, we're very, very proud that it's, it's part of our uh, uh, set of, of programs. Celeste has asked me to make some welcoming remarks, and I, since I have to get back to the mothership uh, right after this, I, I promise you I'll, I'll be very, very brief, because um, I know you've got an exciting day uh, ahead of you uh, and uh, starting off with a great panel. Um, seven years ago, Bryn Yolson and McAfee, who are two economists at uh, MIT Sloan School, published a book called uh, Race Against the Machine. Um, these are two normally um, upbeat writers about the economy, but they were looking at the jobless recovery at that time, 2011. We're just coming out of the, the great, well, the mini great recession. Uh, and um, uh, so they, were beginning, they, they began to look at technology's influence on this jobless recovery. 
Uh, and then in 2013, um, Frey and Osborne, who are two researchers at Oxford University's Martin School, took a deeper dive into that and asked the question, um, what jobs are susceptible to computerization? Uh, and what they found was 47% uh, 40 per, of US employment um, uh, is at risk of computerization. And ironically, they used machine learning and uh, machine robots to, to help them in that research. Uh, now, the important thing here is that this is employment. Uh, and that's diff that's, so that's people in jobs, not just jo not jobs. Because so people aren't distributed across job classes equally. But there are a lot of jobs. And this, so their conclusion of 47% employment is susceptible to computerization. That's in the United States. Um, and then more recently, uh, the McKinsey Global Institute in 2017 published a report. They took a much deeper dive at, at this picture globally. And I'm going to let me get the, the data right here. I have to <laughs> take these off now. Um, and they estimated that 50% of the activities that people are paid to do in the global economy have the potential to be automated by adapting currently demonstrated technologies. So again, they're focusing on activities in jobs. So People do a lot of things in their jobs. Some of them can be automated. And then they go on to further to say, while less than 5% of occupations right, can be fully automated, about 60% of occupations have at least 30% of the activities that, ca that can technically be automated. So these um, estimates are part of the backdrop I see for the amazing work that you all are doing and the world in which your students uh, are entering, are going to enter. And in some cases, they're coming back from that world so that they can upskill, if you will, so they can go back into that world. Um, now, some might look at these developments and, and be alarmed. Uh, I, however, ever the optimist, uh, see this as an opportunity. And there's opportunities for two things, and they're very, very much related. Um, one is an opportunity to explore uh, what you might call um, human-machine hybrids, in which we take advantage of what the machine can do very, very well. And by machine, I sort of mean computers right? and communication technologies. So that, that, that we can explore these models where we identify what the machine can do very, very, very well, often very, very quickly, that frees up time for the humans to do what humans can do really, really well. And, and to date, yet, computers can't do. Now, that, that's, a, that's a fluid boundary. Uh, but things like to persuade, to interpret, to compare, to make judgments, those are things that humans are uniquely capable of doing thus far, uh, but supplemented by, uh, complemented by the, 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 the work that a machine can do. So that's one opportunity. And then the second is to turn the conversation uh, from the future of work to a conversation about the work of the future. And you, this community, is ideally positioned to do that. Uh, I, I have great faith in, in, in what you've done thus far. Um, I think it's a fantastic opportunity that we're in. Uh, so I'll just close with that as a sort of a challenge. Uh, I think that, that um, there are opportunities for us, and, uh, and I hope this community embraces that. So I'm going to duck out here. Thank you, Celeste, and thank you all. I, I apologize. I do have to leave uh, to get, like I say, back to the mothership, but enjoy the day. So I will echo Lee's good morning. Good morning, everyone. And I, and I think, uh, well, first of all, it's a great privilege to facilitate this panel, to be on stage with all three of you. And, uh, and I think it's, uh, it's equally a, a very interesting closing plenary session <laughs> because I think we all were incredibly impressed by um, Dr. Christine Darden as she described her pathway all the way from, you know, she started with her talking doll that she dissected all the way up to <laughs> retiring from NASA and, and the work she'd done. And so we have an, an equally interesting set of pathways to talk about this morning. Um, moving from all three of our presidents have been principal investigators, and they are now currently serving as presidents of community colleges. 
So, so they're going to have very interesting stories to tell you, and I'm just going to very quickly um, introduce them, and then I'm going to let them, I'll let you tell your own story, and then we have some questions. We'll try and wrap up a little early, so if you have questions for each or any one of them, um, please think about that, and we'll try and give you time to ask questions uh, as, as we proceed through. So we have Dr. Edwin Massey from Indian River State College. We have Dr. Annette Parker from South Central College in Minnesota, and Dr. David Harrison from Columbus State Community College. And um, I think all of you uh, are aware that, or have seen, we, we've been joking about the fact that there are currently so many active awards at Columbus State that we're gonna have to do a special, a special rate for everyone, uh, both faculty and students coming from this institution. So with that, I'm gonna turn to um, Ed, and I will let you start with uh, a brief explanation of what you do and where you are. Well, thank you, Dave. Uh, first of all, we'd like to share some of that glory. Yeah. <laughs> don't, right. don't take it off. But uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody in the room. Uh, going through the exhibit area last night and looking at all of the work you're doing, it is absolutely fantastic work. So kudos to each and every one of you. And like Celeste said, I'm Ed Massey. I work for Kevin Cooper and Chris <laughs> Pagnotto. <laughs> If, if you know these guys, you know they are uh, PIs at our place. Uh, and, and Celeste has asked us to go through a little bit of a journey here. Uh, I've, I'm personally and professionally really indebted to NSF ATE. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was working on my doctorate in 1971, my major professor, Dr. John, we all call him Dr. John, uh, came to me with uh, half a package filled out and asked me to fill out the rest of the package. And I really didn't know what it was, but it ended up being a scholarship that would cover all of my graduate work, uh, all of my tuition, all of my books, a stipend to myself. At that time, I had two children, a stipend to my children. And of course, I had a wife, a stipend to my wife. Prior to that, I was working five jobs, trying to keep everything together to earn my earned my PhD, and this was such a relief because then I could go down to only two jobs instead of five, and I'm not sure. My wife and I now have been married uh, 52 years, and I'm not, yeah. <laughs> and I'm really not sure NSF and ATE did not save my marriage at that time <laughs> because we had, we had so much going on. But uh, then I came to Indian River State College as an instructor in 1973. Uh, we we uh, had the opportunity to pick up a Coast Guard Center in our region. And it's the, the, the old red, white, and blue three-story cupola on the top, beautiful, what I call a Northeastern model or the traditional model of the Coast Guard Center. Uh, wrote a grant to try to do that, to help the college do that. That grant was rejected, but also later got uh, two or three other grants. There was some politics involved in getting that building, which actually my father got involved in in the state I came from with the leader at the Washington level. We got the building as a tremendous building, and that's where we house our marine science program. So that was a first small impact with the college. Then in 2004, we were a sub-award from Optech, or mm -hmm. Optonic, uh, excuse me, Optics and Photonics Program. In 2005, Capstone Project for Clark Advanced Learning Center, which, was, which is a charter school that we built on our south campus. It's a high-tech charter high school, and this project was funded, a Capstone Project was funded to do research at the high school level and involve them with research on the restoration of the Everglades. It was a great project where they learned a lot about water, they learned a lot about the environmental impact, and it was a very good project for us at that time. They also got to work with uh, Nathaniel Reed, and some of you may know him, he recently passed away, but he was the assistant uh, secretary of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks at that time. I think that name has changed by now. Uh, 2007, we received a grant in Biotrain. Uh, we had worked very, very hard in our region, which is halfway between West Palm Beach and Port Canaveral on the east coast of Florida. Uh, it was, the economy was really agriculture, residential building, and tourism. 
So we set about at our, in our college around the year 2000, how do we become more proactive as this community changes, trying to determine what this community is going to look like into the future? Uh, of course, we had to get the community on board because it's their community. Uh, it's a retirement community to a large part, so they're very sensitive about what comes in. But uh, we received a grant that would help on this, and it was a bio train to attract in and bring in biotech technology, which we did. We, uh, we brought in several uh, biotech uh, companies where we had internships, worked directly with the biotechs. But the main project here was that the biotech workforce needed to be uh, diversified, and this was a grant to get in uh, more uh, races across the biotech area to diversify the workforce. And we were working with about 220 students, and we did get about 30 involved where we could help diversify the workforce, and that was the important part of that one. 2011, big hit for us. That was the Regional Center Award for the RCNET. It's a regional center for nuclear education training. Currently, many of you in the room today, we have partnerships with 40 colleges, we have partnerships with 10 universities, we have partnerships with over 100 business partners, and many of you are partners today with us on the RCNET, or the Nuclear Tech Program. Following in uh, 2013, a big hit on the Regional Center for Laser Technology. Uh, Chris Paniota is here today, had a display downstairs last night. That one partners with 34 colleges and over 100 different industries, with Corning being one of our major industries. And then in 2010, I'm a marine biochemist. So in 2010, I was actually PI of the COSI grant, the COSI Center on our campus. That is a center of ocean science and educational excellence. Um, we'll talk about some of the properties and characteristics yeah. of that maybe down the road, but that's when I served as a PI, uh, and we had four major entities in our community, our college, Florida Institute of Technology, which is now Florida Tech, an organization called ORCA, it's uh, a center for uh, Research and Conservation Association, Ocean Research and Conservation Association, and we have a branch of the Smithsonian in our community. And the head of the branch of the Smithsonian, myself as president, the head of ORCA, and a high-ranking dean at Florida Tech worked on that particular project. So had a long history with, with uh, NSF, uh, even keeping me married and keeping me in school. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, let's turn to Annette. Okay, so uh, I'm going to start maybe from a, a completely different perspective um, because, um, and when I call out your name, <laughs> if you're in the crowd by state or by institution, let me know because as I checked in this morning, I heard people from Minnesota were looking for me. Anybody <laughs> here from Minnesota? Okay. Well, I, I heard an oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So anyway, um, I uh, graduated from Lansing Community College and I started a different route. I started a lot like your community college students. Um, I went to General Motors at a young age, uh, married my husband, and um, saw the uptick of the auto industry and the decline. And so at across the dinner table, we said, somebody's gotta go back to school, who's that? Um, <laughs> it was Annette. Uh, so, <laughs> So I went to Lansing Community College and received an associate degree in industrial drafting. And I, I figured out how I could use uh, an interest in art in the automotive industry. And so while I was a student um, at Lansing Community College, they observed me uh, in the machine shop and in the drafting labs and they said, hey Annette, you want a job? And so on the same day, they asked me, did I want a job in the drafting labs? I said, yeah. And so then they said, do you want a job in the machine shop? And I said, yeah. And so I went home and told my husband, I said, I have two jobs. 
Okay. And so about a week later, HR was processing my paperwork and they said, you can't do that. Do you want a promotion? I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so then I became a lab tech at, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, a, yeah, a lab technician at Lansing Community College. And then that led to teaching and a passion a deep passion for teaching. And I taught at Lansing Community College for 12 years. And um, during that time, General Motors began to continue to decline. And so the governor uh, at that time was John Engler, said, you know, he was building what you call Michigan Technical Education Centers, MTECs. And those were new centers that would be more responsive to business and industry um, and Lansing built the last MTech in the state of Michigan. And so the, the um, and it was promised to General Motors, if you build two new plants in Lansing, we'll build a new campus. And so um, they, they locked in the two campuses, I'm, I'm sorry, the two plants, and um, the, the dean came up to me and says, Annette, you're gonna apply to you know, be the chair to run this and help build this new campus? And I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and so I went into administration and I helped um, move into this new campus and all of the curriculum in the campus had to be, sounds like an, a, a new thing, modulized, competency-based, open entry, open exit. So we, we did that and all of a sudden Toyota came up and said, from Kentucky, anybody here from Kentucky? Okay, right. there we go, and said, would you be interested in coming to Kentucky to be a part of a national center of excellence, a vision for a national center of excellence in advanced automotive manufacturing? Again, I said yes. <laughs> Is there a clue here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. And so I took off to Kentucky in 2007. Um, and initially it was a planning grant, I believe, that started in around 2005, and I was a co-PI at Lansing. So in 2008, we wrote a successful uh, center grant, national center grant, uh, for advanced automotive manufacturing called Amtec. And it was a scary time because uh, I submitted the proposal in August, uh, I'm sorry, October of 2008. And if you remember the time, that's when Ford, GM, and Chrysler were flying planes into DC to ask for assistance to keep from going bankrupt from the financial crisis. And we had partners in the Southeast, um, we had partners in the Midwest, Asian, um, American made, and European made auto companies. And their legislators weren't being very kind to each other. Um, and so I said, this is gonna be really good or really bad and we got the Center of Excellence. Uh, we were awarded uh, that December of 2008, and um, the center became really an, a hit. And the question that NSF asked us is, could competing auto companies work together? And could competing colleges work together? And over the three years of the planning grant, we proved that we could build a we mentality about that body of work. And um, it went on in 2011, it was selected by the National Governors Association as a national best practice of how to work across uh, competing industries, competing states, and complete competing regions uh, to um, build a new kind of technical worker, they called it. And then um, I went on to um, work with um, Secretary um, Clinton um, that took me off to India to help the, uh, the, the Indian nation figure out how to work on this type of work. And the U.S. Department of Education, uh, I went to uh, Germany and worked with them that ended up funding a, a project through the European Union to look at how we could um, look at different standards, the European standards for the auto industry, and the American standards for the auto industry. And so that's some of the successes uh, that we had during that time. And so then in 2012, and um, so how do I get to be a president? I, I never was a vice president. I was an executive director in, in uh, Versailles, Kentucky, 
I had about four staff, and I get a call in 2012 that says, hey, are you interested in being a president? <laughs> what do you think I said? <laughs> yes. <laughs> sure. <laughs> no, I said, are you kidding? <laughs> I've never, I've never been a vice president. They said, well, how do you, well, you know, you should take your resume and your body of work and look at the job profile for a president and take all of the duties that you had and align it to that body of work. And so I did that. And then they called me back and they says, that's great. Can you send us two? <laughs> and that led to me uh, being a finalist for two presidencies in Minnesota. Um, and ultimately picking South Central College um, in Minnesota. Um, and so I'm gonna end here in just a second, but the, the last thing that happened is three months after I got to, um, to Minnesota, I get a call in my office and it's Secretary Pritzker. And she says, um, Annette, uh, we need you to serve on President Obama's Advanced Manufacturing Partnership Steering Committee. What do you think I said? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I went off to do that, and really what I, how I really looked at it is that when, I, when I got hired in Minnesota, the chancellor said to me, Annette, I want you to be president of South Central, but I want you to help us with workforce across the state. And I'm like, now how am I gonna do that? But the minute I got appointed to uh, the president's commission, I said, I know how to do that now. And so we positioned Minnesota to continue some of the work that we learned from, uh, from NSF, and um, it's benefited the state um, significantly. And so I'll talk more about the aspects of what that means and what it means for um, a state of higher education um, and colleges individually. So thank you. Thank you. Hey, it's David. Well, as Celeste said, we've got a few Columbus State people in the house uh, this week. In fact, okay, let's hear it. Come on. <laughs> we shut down the college starting Wednesday, <laughs> and this week has become ATE week at Columbus State Community College. But uh, now a lot of great people doing a lot of great work, and I'm proud to be uh, be part of their team. Uh, Tracy, my wife, and I haven't been married as long as Ed and his wife. We've been married almost 28 years. And ATE almost had the opposite impact for wow. us. <laughs> <laughs> because as I'll talk about, I've been involved uh, in the program from the very beginning. And this conference uh, for a few years was uh, the same weekend as our anniversary. Uh, okay. So cool. I, I had to choose between my wife and Liz Tellis. Uh oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> And I knew my wife well. She was very understanding. I was just getting to know Liz. So, <laughs> so the first few years, um, I came here. And I was really glad when ATE decided to change the date, um, especially with three young kids at home. Tracy wasn't coming with me. Um, I've been involved uh, with ATE literally my whole higher ed career. Um, so I joined. Um, a new partnership in 1993 uh, between the University of Dayton and Sinclair Community College. They uh, had come together to create a, a, a partnership called the Advanced Integrated Manufacturing Center to combine the assets of both institutions to help local manufacturing uh, in, the, in the Dayton area. I had been uh, working in consulting in Pittsburgh um, with uh, Accenture back before it was Accenture. Um, and it was really an IT, but it was manufacturers were my clients. So uh, they hired me as, as the first director. And again, this was in uh, July of 1993, um, as the first RFP was coming out for, uh, for the ATE program. Uh, so I had been on the job literally a few weeks when the people from my search committee came in and said, we've got this opportunity with NSF that we think the AIM Center is perfectly positioned for. Uh, and I didn't know what I didn't know, so, and, but I'd you know, written a ton of proposals uh, in private industry and connected with uh, Sinclair's uh, great uh, uh, grant, uh, grant leader, Neil Herb Kersman, who many of you know. Um, I was starting a new job. No one really knew what I was supposed to be doing anyway, so Neil and I just kind of huddled in a conference room uh, for the next couple of months and started putting this, uh, this proposal together. 
uh, and we were awarded one of the first three national centers, uh, the National Center of Excellence for Advanced Manufacturing Education uh, in, in 1994. Um, and as we were talking earlier, I, I learned community colleges uh, through the ATE program. Um, we uh, had uh, great success in our work with, uh, uh, with the AIM Center, and then um, I became Dean of Business Technologies at Sinclair, uh, and was PI then on another NSF grant in Information Technology, then moved to, uh, to Florida, became Chief <coughs> Academic Officer at, at Seminole State College, and in that role, uh, became co-PI of a, uh, uh, a grant that Daytona Beach Community College uh, had in information technology. Uh, went then a few years later to the University of Central Florida, national champion University of Central Florida, for those of you who <laughs> follow that. Um, and uh, and the, last, the last thing I was involved in at UCF was a, uh, a partnership with Valencia College on developing a Bachelor of Science uh, in Information Technology uh, in a 2 plus 2 pathway. Uh, was uh, fortunate uh, to uh, be hired on as uh, Columbus State's president in 2010. Um, and Columbus State hadn't done a lot with, uh, with ATE, um, uh, certainly in, in recent years. And uh, we, st we started building that uh, methodically. Um, the, um, uh, first of all, I brought my friend, Neil Herb Kirsman from Sinclair, who had retired and, and said, um, we need some help here. Um, and Neil was with us for, for a few weeks and said, yeah, you're right, you do. <laughs> um, and, uh, but then, you know, methodically started putting, um, putting a, a team together because we had faculty who really wanted to do some things. Um, and we wanted to figure out ways to, uh, to support them and um, got our first uh, grant uh, <coughs> started, in, or the award came in 2014. I think we got two, one in manufacturing uh, and one in logistics, um, and um, now have um, PIs here in construction management and several IT fields in manufacturing, in logistics, uh, in automotive technology, uh, and really, I think, it started to create a culture of innovation that uh, that we'll talk more about, but we're trying to make it easy for faculty to, um, uh, to, to get involved in things that they care, that they care about. The, the manufacturing work has become a uh, uh, kind of a, it's not yet a methodology for us, but it's something that we're trying to, to scale because it's a, a work study opportunity that started with Honda, um, where students are working three days a week, uh, they're in school two days a week, they're earning an associate degree uh, by the time they're, they're 20, um, debt-free, making good money along the way. Um, we've now got 30 manufacturers that are part of that. Um, and um, I was invited along with Honda uh, last, last summer to the Joint Economic Committee in Washington, the Joint uh, House and Senate Committee, um, talking about the disconnect between you know, 6.5 million um, uh, open jobs and 6 million unemployed people. How do we make that connection? Um, and the answer was deeper alignment between community colleges uh, and employers, and, and that's ATE's sweet spot. So um, uh, I've, I've grown up with the ATE program um, and uh, am, uh, am really grateful for the opportunity. That's great, and we're glad you're all here. So um, different types of career pathways, but if you think about as you moved along into a presidency, did you take any skills or things you learned as a principal investigator towards that, towards what you are now doing and how you approach a college presidency and, and, and enact, you know, in, in essence, working with your community, working with the students? What, 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 what did you take from the principal investigator role? Ed, let's. Well, my journey was a little different because yeah. I, was, uh, I had been president 22 years before I became a PI. So I made all my mistakes mm. <laughs> as being president, and then I was ready to be a PI. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it's a very similar role, and I would encourage all of you to, to really think long and hard about what you do every day. And what you do every day is you, you organize a body of people, you organize a body of talent that you're working with, you're creating a culture within your ATE program 
I was really glad to hear David mention culture because I am, am so high on culture. Hopefully we get a chance to talk a little bit more in depth about that. But you, you build that culture around your ATE program and through that, you're doing a tremendous amount of collaboration. Mm -hmm. You're doing a tremendous amount of assigning and supporting people to do certain parts of a project. Same thing in running a college. A couple of things that you may not think about is if you're like our college, I love to bring our PIs in front of our board of trustees because our PI programs are some of the most innovative programs on our campus. And I want the Board of Trustees to understand how this college is moving forward to solve the, the problems of technicians today and also positioning ourselves to solve those problems into the future. So you may not think about it, but if you're a PI and you've come before Board of Trustees, then if you make that application, you, you, can, you can embellish that a little bit to say, yes, you have been affiliated with boards in one way or another. I don't lie, don't go too far. <laughs> but the other thing is, is uh, we bring our PIs before our staff meetings, before our faculty meetings. They're very exposed across our campus. All of those are great learning opportunities. You're, you're coming before a group that is not familiar scientifically or mathematically with what you're doing so you learn this thing of being able to communicate even within the college to lay people that really don't understand some of the things you're actually working on. The other thing that you're probably doing like we're doing across your college is we try to be very, very interdisciplinary. Uh, we don't want the ATE project to be a silo unto itself. Mm -hmm. We want them working with the math people. We want them working with the science people. We want them working with the English people. Why not incorporate in writing topics related to some of these critical issues that we're helping to solve today and are going to be part of the future? That gives an English student a broader perspective of the work that's being done, but also gives them a little bit of an introduction and not just literary writing, but also an introduction into being able to describe scientific things that are taking place, which is so important in, in today's world. So I think uh, the collaboration, the visioning of what you have for your own ATD program, the presentations out there, and going back to that a little bit, when you go before the Board of Trustees, your challenge is not to talk about your program, your challenge is to talk to a group of lay people using a language that is understandable to them so that they will understand your project and what you're doing within the institution. So you have team building, you have collaboration, you have visioning, you're working with all kinds of bodies, and then you're building strong partnerships outside our, of our institution. And when I say partnership, we treat that uh, Kevin and I have had a lot of conversations. A partnership is not a handshake and $100. A partnership is you got some real skin in the game to make this program function. And uh, if we have a little bit more time without going too long, I'll talk a little bit more about the partnerships and show you how those are involved in Indian River to actually build the cooling system of a nuclear power plant within one of our buildings as we were building out our campus. So uh, I think from facilities to program planning to visioning to collaboration, all those skills cross uh, same kinds of things to be a leader at any level and also to be a president. That's a great response. Mm -hmm. and, and I'd also say that something that, that you wove through there is that you're also looking at developing a STEM literate citizenry, mm -hmm. which is another one or part of the mission of the National Science Foundation. So that, that's another one for everybody to think about because that is part of what NSF is charged with doing. Mm -hmm. So that's, which is great. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so um, I'll try to add on to, um, to Ed's comments a little bit. And, you know, I, I had a conversation with uh, some PIs last night 
And one of the things that I always did with all of my presidents is when they talked about the, their vision for our institution, I could hear my role in it. And I always tried to understand how I could advance the college, college's mission and vision. And I think that that is uh, very, very important. And so we have these great centers and these great projects. And it'll be very easy for you to think about how does that advance the institution's core mission and vision? Because it does. And so you need to always help the board and the college leadership understand how your work advances that. Uh, even for me as a college president today, I report to a chancellor who reports to a board of trustees, and he uh, has three core buckets that we put our body of work into. And it's uh, institutional sustainability, it's diversity, and student success. And so it's easy for me to take South Central College's work and put them into those buckets. They're values that we all have as, um, as employees in higher education. So always listen to that and then help your president and help your board of trustees and your college leadership understand how your work is advancing that. <coughs> and that's really aligned to the national vision. Um, you know, institutions and states are still aligned to uh, the vision that comes out of AACC, uh, what our federal legislators are um, doing to advance our work. Um, I was saying last night, um, advanced technological education through the NSF really owns the space for this discussion about the future workforce. And we need to claim that. And we need to help our administrators, our leaders, our legislators in our communities even, understand how we advance that mission and vision. Uh, because your role is critical to that. So for me, um, to get a little more specific about how I did it, um, because I talked about um, you know, getting a call and saying I was nominated to be a president and I said, you're kidding, I can't do that. Um, I'd never even been a vice president. So how did I do that? I went to the job profile. So every presidency, there's generally a job profile that talks about the things that they're looking for in, the, in a presidency. And I took um, different elements of the work that I did in running a center and applied it to that body, you know, to that response. And, um, and, and I was very successful in that. I had a corporate board um, that I met with every Thursday that were um, executives from all of the plants um, or, or all the auto companies, Ford, General Motors, Toyota, Nissan, were all on my board. And we met every Thursday and they would advance the work in their, um, at their plants around uh, the country. And so um, that was like managing a board. Uh, and I could tell um, the um, folks in Minnesota that I had that experience through ATE. I had other opportunities to work with legislators. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I um, did some work with um, Secretary Clinton and the Department of Education. And just before I left for Minnesota, I uh, um, I um, testified at the uh, energy, uh, the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee, and all of those experiences I could then share um, around being a president. And then, how do you really take your work and make sure that it's embedded into the institution in a sustainable way, so that uh, the college is going to take those strategies and, and implement it into curriculum, but not just your curriculum, to Ed's point, into curriculum throughout the community college. And that's important too. Um, and last, I'm gonna say um, a couple of words that always strikes a president's ear, that's persistence, completion, success, okay? And you know, we were talking last night about the impact data 
that the centers really need to ask their IR offices for that information so that you can prove that the work you do impacts the uh, success of students in your institution. And there's nothing more powerful for a board of trustees or for a president to understand what your contribution is in that work. So um, those would be my um, primary comments, and I look forward to continuing the conversation. So, so it's bright up here, but I'm hoping you're all taking notes because these are, you're getting some great suggestions. So, <laughs> and from David, who grew up with ATE. Yeah. Well, leadership at any level um, really is about bringing people together to, to, to solve a, a common problem. Um, Ed talked about vision and, and really trying to work through that and um, the um, opportunity to connect employers and, and faculty and staff uh, is really the essence of, of, of ATE. As a, as a PI, when you get that award letter, um, you think that you know, this is the most important thing in the world. What it means on your campus is more work for busy people. Um, you know, so, so the ability to um, uh, kind of get them into your, into your movie um, is, uh, is a skill that really is transferable. And, and, and um, uh, everything you do is a negotiation. Uh, and really being able to help um, uh, HR and, and accounting and um, purchasing uh, and other academic units uh, understand um, what, uh, what you're trying to do, how it does tie back uh, to the, the broader vision of the college um, is really important for the success of your project, but it's also a great skills building opportunity because those skills are transferable uh, in any uh, leadership role that you, uh, that you would, uh, uh, would have the opportunity to serve in. The other specific thing with ATE that I think has been um, a great leadership development opportunity has been this, you know, this kind of convening uh, because it allows you really quickly to realize you're not in this alone. Um, and, and these can be pretty lonely pursuits uh, when you're trying to do some new things and you know, not everybody gets it the first time you try to do it. Uh, and just understanding um, that, that others are struggling through that as well. It's not just your college that has this bureaucracy um, that seems to be working against you, um, but the ability to have uh, kind of uh, like-minded colleagues um, understanding how different state policies affect what you're trying to do, understanding how different K-12 relationships uh, might affect what you're trying to do, different industries, different employers. All of those are great, uh, great learning experiences, again, that are transferable into a lot of leadership situations. So just a quick show of hands. You're, you're all going to get an online email that says, please fill out this evaluation form. And one of the questions is, how many of you have made a new contact at this conference that could possibly lead to a new collaboration? Wow, great. It's great. That's great. I just saw, before we came up here, uh, <laughs> Ellen Cabot Lynch, who was one of the other uh, 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 center directors in that yeah. first cohort. Uh, and Ellen and I would have a lot of conversations about, are we allowed to do this? I don't know, check with Liz. Yeah. I, t I talked to her last time, you check with Liz. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but those, those kinds of, 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 of relationships uh, really do last your career. That's great. All right, so we could go for you know, hours yet, so I'm, I'm gonna skip a little bit ahead uh, and ask you about the resources each of you have been able to use to support the success, even getting faculty to think about writing and crafting projects. Uh, I, I know there's always, I, I always do it in outreach, I say, you have that wonderful moment when you get the award letter and you go, everybody's, everybody's so excited. And then it dawns on you and you go, oh bleep, we actually have to do this. You know, think about all the things that we put down in that proposal and we got the award, we now have to actually do it. So, um, so, uh, so David, let's start with you. Well, we're, we're still in the process, I think, of, of, of building that out. Um, and we're, we're trying to create a, uh, uh, an environment where it's easy for faculty uh, to, to do this work. Uh, and we uh, have been fortunate to, to get 
uh, several, not just ATE grants, but we've gotten some others as well. Um, so it has enabled us to build uh, a, an office, not just, not just to get more grants, but we're really starting to create an infrastructure for post-award uh, support. Um, and again, we're not there yet. You never really arrive because each one of these, you learn something new. Um, but with each one, we are trying to, to improve continuously. And that also helps with the interface back to the college so that these aren't one-off kinds of things. This is part of what, of, of what we do. Um, and it um, uh, assists in the sustainability as well because um, this is, you know, uh, Dean Bortz, one of our construction management faculty and I were talking before, this is seed money. That's the way we look at it. This is venture capital mm -hmm. um, to, uh, to try something new, but it's something, it, it ought to be something you want to do as an institution anyway. It isn't just about um, uh, getting a grant. Uh, the, the, the grant proposals that we write, it's work we're going to do anyway, but the external funding allows us to do it more quickly, do it with partners, um, uh, do it more creatively uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, and uh, we uh, have been able to put together uh, what I think is a great team um, that, uh, that supports uh, the faculty and the, uh, uh, the other offices at the college uh, that require this to move forward. Again, we got, uh, we've got work to do, we've got a ways to go, um, but, uh, but I feel good about the, the path we're on. All right, Annette. Well, I think he's doing pretty darn good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me let me just say that um, you know when I would when I was a PI, I, we were having some conversations about sustainability of grants, and I always thought about my grant um, as sustainable, right from the beginning of planning it, and so. Um, but as a president, let me say that um, one of the things that 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 I have done is uh, really to make sure that I build the infrastructure to support all of the grants that we apply for at South Central College. And that it's aligned to our uh, mission and vision um, and, um, and everybody understands that, that it advances our agenda and our work. And so um, what we've done is uh, there's a grants office uh, everybody that applies for a grant um, fills out a form that talks about all the things that they need to be successful. We have grant managers, we have writers, we have people that will help with the reporting because we know the PIs have other important work to do. They need that assistance to be successful. And so we build all of that around it. And so one of the things they're talking about right from the beginning is how does this align to the college's mission and vision. And so uh, we have uh, a, a, had a great ATE project with Doug Laven in Mechatronics. And Doug's a rock star on our campus. Everybody loves Doug, and I know they love him. There's people that love him here and within NSF. Um, and you know, we make sure that Doug has the resources that he needs to be successful, that he doesn't feel overwhelmed because that's gonna take away from his body of work it's gonna take away from his students. And so um, we, we build that right in. When I first arrived at South Central, we didn't do indirects. Um, and so we built in indirect because that funds the resources to wrap around our PI so that they can be successful uh, with their work. And so that's really how we do it at South Central College um, to make sure that that it's something that's, um, that's um, sustainable. And let me just say that every grant is, we look at that way. So we started, uh, when I first got there, we started around uh, apprenticeships um, is, is something we focus on, or internships, um, the stackable credentials, um, the, the pathways, um, and we've done that with multiple things, and so as, uh, different grants, whether it's through AACC, uh, we were part of the Right Signals, if, um, or the Guided Pathways. Um, all of this work advances a bigger mission and vision, and so we bring that, those, those PIs in as part of advancing that work. 
That's great. All right, Ed. Okay, thank you. Um, all of you that raised your hand a while ago, please keep that network going. Right. It's so important. Um, David and I have worked together. I, I met this young lady today. Mm -hmm. yeah. David and I worked together for a long, long time. Uh, we're walking away from here with a partnership today. Mm -hmm. So it never stops, and that, that's a big part of it. In, at Indian River, uh, we have an established grant uh, office and platform. We couple a couple of other things with the grants office. We couple IR with the grants office. They're in the mm -hmm. same physical space. Mm -hmm. uh, evidence through data is very, very important. Yes. All of our ATE PIs, as well as other people, need access to that as quickly and as easily as possible without having to drill through four or five layers to get access to that data. And we also have EDP, which is employee development in the same physical area as our ATE office. So it's a constant training of employees across the institution. And it provides for tremendous communication. But we have a platform that's followed up. Uh, first of all, let me say that anyone that has an idea on campus can come to the grants office. It's very, very visible. It's very open. And let's talk about your ideas. Your ideas may not make it to a proposal. They could take another route and still make it in some other way. But let's talk about your ideas and let's find a way to say yes mm -hmm. on those ideas because they're all good. Uh, once we select to go after a particular award, uh, it will be co-written by our grant writers and our faculty members. They will be heavily involved in that process we have a finance, a piece of the finance office that is uh, specifically involved with the grants that come into the institution. And we do something a little different here. In the grants office, they actually have a goal of bringing in 14% of our operating budget each year. Ooh, I didn't hear any boos and things. <laughs> many, many times when I say that in a big group, I hear this deep breath taken. Oh. Yeah. But they actually have a goal. Many times they hit that goal. It's, it's not a goal that you, you know, some years we're just not going to make it. But for the most part, they hit that goal. And uh, we celebrate that. And they have big charts in their offices where they have the grants marked out. They, they have their goal on the wall, and they work toward that. So I think we have a well-organized platform. We have good communication in that, a tremendous amount of synergy across college programs with the grants office. And then when we, when we go forward and build, and I talked a little bit about what we were trying to do with our community, we have built about 300, right at 400,000 square feet of buildings all of which have STEM programs in those buildings. So you'll find robotics and technology, you'll find optics and nuclear. Um, and what we've done is to build support labs around the ATE programs. So I'd love for you to come down and look at the building, the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Building. It has a nanotechnology lab in it. It has optics and photonics. It has an alternative energy lab. It has a maker space and a green construction area. And it has nuclear technology with that indoor loop, flow loop, which is a cooling system of a nuclear power plant is the easiest way. And it also, because it's so sensitive in nuclear, there's a big piece of it, the cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. Now with those disciplines working together and cross matching, sustainability, and diversification thinking early on in your project for the continuation and the sustainability of that project drawing on these other skills is critical. And we have did that for the renewal of the nuclear. Mm -hmm. Luckily, in the optics and photonics, there's still not, not enough programs to meet the workforce in the, in the nation. Uh, so that one was renewed based on continued turning out the advanced technicians to meet the already out there workload that we have we have to meet. So that that uh, in a nutshell kind of sums up uh, our thing. And it does not hurt 
it does not hurt to have a scientist as a president. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So, all of you guys that put your hands up, go for the presidency, and that would do more to advance community colleges across the nation in thinking about this work and the future that we have to do. Mm -hmm. That's an even broader vision than I had. I was going to say, how many of you, when you go home, might make an appointment with your president to talk about some of the issues mm. that you <laughs> heard today, right? But, but, but Ed, you, you, moved it, you moved the needle a lot farther along. Uh -huh. <laughs> so so I, I know we're getting close to time, but um, you're, you're in positions now, and, and you're, you're forward thinking, all of you, you know, each one of you are. If you were going to look at <clears throat> being part of the ATE community, and what you see as the community college role in preparing students for the future workforce, even pushing it out to say maybe even the next 25 years, what, 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 will you, what would you do? What are you thinking about? Just a few last thoughts. Annette, we wanna? Sure, so um, is Celeste knows because she's seen me a few times, I'm on a couple of committees at the National Academies has been looking at this work recently and um, in, in uh, Tuesday, I was at the first meeting at MIT, uh, a research team is looking at the future of work. I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, the people on that committee are, are, um, almost had me questioning whether, you know, I'd ask them, tell them, give them my opinion, and they say, well, what do you think? I mean, cause there's a lot of brains on that uh, committee. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but let me just say that really what I think it is is the adaptability and the resiliency and the agility of the workforce. And I think that ATE is, a great, um, is in great position because uh, you all think about those things. You're thinking this week about the next project, the next big thing. And those are the skills that you have to instill in the students in the community college for them to be successful. Because the, the, the work of the future, and we decided to change it to, um, instead of the future of work, to the work of the future, will be uh, different and it will require our students to be more agile uh, so that they can adapt. Um, and I'm just gonna say that when I started General Motors uh, and the things that I saw, um, t today, uh, some of those, those um, same operations are going on, but with technology enhancements, okay? And so things didn't change that much. They changed. And some of the physical labor that I saw with people being injured is no longer in those facilities. And it takes brains to do that work. And that's what ATE is advancing. And, uh, and I think we have a bright future. So this work is gonna look at, uh, the research that we're gonna do, it's gonna look at the, the future, you know, what, it, what are those um, fundamental skills that everyone's gonna have to have. And I would suggest is agility and adaptability to the change. And a level of emotional intelligence on how you work with people, um, and um, how you can advance um, common goals. David. Piggyback quickly on what Ed said about having um, scientists in leadership positions. I mean, we need more people in leadership positions in all walks of life uh, who understand STEM and, and, and technology and the process of technology. Um, my first degree is chemical engineering. No one would accuse me of being a scientist, including when I was an undergraduate. Um, <laughs> but, but understanding the process and the value of it is, is more important than it's ever been. So I want to reiterate that. I mean, you, you need to consider uh, that in your career path because we need you uh, out here. With regard to ATE, I mean, look at the, look at the title of this session, uh, Development of America's Technological Workforce. Is that going to become more important or less important? Um, this is uh, the golden age of the community college, there's no question uh, in my mind. Uh, when you look at what's happening with, uh, with the future of work, when you look at what's happening demographically in so many of our communities uh, and, uh, and the needs that our students have, we are better equipped than any institutions uh, to address it. Uh, and ATE's 
uh, support in providing this venture capital to really allow us to be innovative, to allow us to try new things, to, to uh, enable us to work together uh, in new kinds of ways is critical. The last 25 years has prepared ATE for the next 25, and we've really got to look at it that way. That's a great thought. Ed, Ed closing comments? Yeah. Um, first of all, we come, we bring our trustees to Washington every year. Um, when you do that and, and try to some way get on that team, if you're not currently on that team to come to Washington, very important to go around and talk uh, to the legislators about the agencies. Mm -hmm. This is our way that we get some of the federal money returned to our communities through the agencies. And this is also a strong argument to ATE for the future of the workforce because it's going to be in the hands of the community colleges. So go back, work hard to adjust your culture, to uh, be receptive of change, uh, embrace change, welcome change. That's, that's kind of the model of the community colleges. We're very entrepreneurial in the way we think, in the way we work. And I, 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 I'll figure out something else to end with, but historically across the nation, we're seeing the, the systematic defunding of uh, post-secondary education in a lot of states. Mm -hmm. So we have to couple money together to make these things happen. So to make the programs happen that I talked about a while ago, every one of them is a combination of state dollars, it's a combination of ATE dollars, and it's a combination of an awful lot of private fundraising. Now the other thing, if you're gonna become a president, you have to learn to love chicken. <laughs> You're going to have a lot of chicken to eat where you raise a lot of money, okay? And the other thing, the, the, we're going to have to make some tough calls. Uh, we had to eliminate a couple of programs this year because already technology intrusion had eliminated, and I'll give you one easy example, is dental technology. Uh, no longer is that high demand to make the appliances for the dental work because your teeth are made in the dental office when you go now by machines and they don't need the people and it eliminated one of our programs. But those tough decisions have to be made to repurpose that money and move it into the future programs that we're thinking about, we're designing and we're building right now. There's nobody better to advise the president of institution than you guys. Mm -hmm. No one better. There's no saying where I came from. Let hunting dogs hunt. <laughs> I'm not putting anybody down, okay? But let hunting dogs hunt. You guys are it. You guys are in line with the mission. You're in line with the future. Don't be shy about moving it forward on your campuses. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. All right. And, and I, I knew this would be a tough panel to just have an hour on. Um, I have lots of other questions, and we have more, you know, if we had more time, we could do it. I'm sorry I didn't leave any time for, um, for questions from the audience, but I would say that in, in addition, that whole agility and flexibility, um, when I came up after Dr. Darden's talk, and, and, and I gave a few adjectives that I thought were really important, one I didn't put out there, and I think I'd like to add it, life long learning. Yes. Because she exemplified that, and I think we've see, we see it again today, and I think we have an entire audience, all faculty and students, you know, perk up here a little bit. Um, it's important. Mm -hmm. It leads to agility and flexibility. So thank you very much, and thank you, each of you. Thank you. That was great. Yeah,